I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Oh, glory to his name. Wow. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Go ahead. Now we're singing this song about singing glory to his name. Amen. And there's something that we serve a God that he's worthy of our praise. Amen. Oh, amen. Yes, amen. And I'm a little frustrated that we don't have more jubilation and excitement of what's going on here. Aren't you, honey tree? It's just kind of like, ah, glory to you. But we really have a reason this morning. We do, If for you did sure. not have a reason already to say glory to his name. Because this is the first Sunday in several months we've had a whole family. And now it's the whole family's here. Amen. We got them all, wow. including baby Micah. But the Lawrences with Aaron and Megan Lawrence are here at Calvary Glory Christian to Fellowship his name. for the first time. Glory to his name. Jesus, blessed be your holy name. Let's stretch our hands out to this family right praise here. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. We do give glory to your name. Hallelujah. For your healing power and your touch that you're God. doing in Megan's life. Bless we thank you, Lord, for baby name. Micah and the blessing yes. that he is. For the precious daughters, Lord, as well. And Lord, we thank you for Shelly and the family yes. that have been helping thank out. You. But Lord, we also thank you for this man of God that you've placed into yes, Megan's Lord. life yes. and Aaron, Lord. We thank you for the strength and courage and resolve that he has had, Lord, to be a great husband during this season, Lord. And we Praise thank you for Jesus. Megan, for blessing her and touching her, Lord God. Yes, and we are God. excited about what you're going to continue to Hallelujah, do in Lord. her body and in her life, that she can be a testimony unto others of your glory and your praise. Thank it's in you. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let's give glory to his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to So rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. to your Thank name, you, Lord. What a wonderful you, God you are. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, right now we just lift up our hands Thank you, and ask that in each of us you would pour in that wonderful Thank spirit, you, the Holy Spirit of healing, yes, Jesus. 
healing of spirit, soul, and body just mm. pour into us, Lord. As we draw near to you, Father, we know you draw near to us. And you're a healing God. You're worthy of all praise. Blessed be your name, O Lord. The chimes of time ring out the news. Another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. He's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. There is no night, for in His light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home, wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others. He'll do for you. I'm 
fighting the good fight with the blessed assurance that the battle is already won. And I'm greatly blessed and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of Child of God, child of God, standing upright on God's good earth. And count my blessings, great things He has done. I'm fighting the good fight with a blessed assurance that the battle is all. forgiven imperfect but forgiven child of God I'm a child of God amen let's give a praise offering to the Lord praise you Lord blessed assurance Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his This is 
one more perfect submission all is at rest I am my savior I'm happy and blessed wow what a wonderful presence of Jesus thank you Lord hallelujah perfect submission all is at rest I Blessed be your holy name. Wow. I just want to take a moment to say that it wasn't too far from here. Um, the, the art school was on Berry Street, and John Lloyd lived a couple blocks away. And I came as a s senior in high school to visit my sister, who was a member, uh, a student at the art school. And we were both hippies. We were smoking pot. We were looking for, you know, whatever in any direction to fill the empty place in our hearts. But a, a revival had broken out in the art school because John Lloyd was leading students to Christ. And so the first thing when I came to visit, I was only in town for like three days over Easter break. And, but the Christians just gathered around me immediately and began to explain that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And he put all my sins on Jesus on the cross and paid the whole price. And if I would believe that and receive Christ into my heart, God would forgive me and cleanse me so much that I would be saved forever and clean me so much that Jesus would move in and live in my heart. That's what got me because I knew I had an empty place in my heart. And so I, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I got born again, and now I can sing, This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior because... I know that my sins are not okay. How many can just say that? My sins are not okay. But they are washed away. They are taken away by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He put them. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. One more. 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Brother Bob, if you men would get to work now and handing out the elements. Normally we take communion on the first Sunday of the month, but uh, we've just had some different things happen in our calendar this month, So, but we still believe in it, and we're grateful for the healing power that we can have through the act of taking communion. Amen. As Honey Tree said, we're grateful for our good and loving God who's willing to forgive us of our sin, and He's also our healer and our provider. And he'll provide a healing touch in your in body, soul, and spirit. And it's about really simple to do. All we got to do is ask him for that healing touch within our lives. And uh, so as these men are getting their way through there, I hope that we're always mindful of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Where he did take upon all of our sins upon him and put it upon that cross. And his body that was uh, beaten and pierced and uh, crucified on that cross, that he did that as an act that he could be the perfect lamb, lamb slain before the world. That from then on, for over 2,000 years now, for those that call upon Jesus, can be saved and receive that healing touch of the forgiveness of sins in their life. And also that we must be mindful that it was a blood sacrifice. Not only what happened with his body, but his blood was shed on Calvary. And that blood, though, has a power of resurrection healing in it because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, like other people of other faiths, leaders that they've had, those men, you can go and visit their tombs and there'd be a body that you can see that's within them. But not so for Jesus Christ, for he rose from the dead. He conquered death in the grave through that resurrection healing power of the blood. And that blood that we are about to take is symbolic of that healing power of resurrection touch that you too can have in your life. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verse 26, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's break of the body of Christ and partake of this wafer. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us take of the cup and receive that healing into our lives. Amen. Amen. If you're grateful for the healing touch that we've received this morning through the act of communion, let's praise the Lord. Now, I'm kind of old school, and we kind of um, like singing. I'm glad Honey Tree did a few today of hymns. It's good to have the hymns. I love the hymns. They've got great doctrine in them. And you know what? We had somebody, when Dad mentioned last week, that they'd like to have the hymns around. Now, David, we appreciate you and Ben with what you're doing with the screen, but we're going to go old school next week. I've got my box. I'm going to be carting it along. Pray for me that my back can carry this burden upon me. But anyways, we're going to bring hymn books that will be available to use next Sunday. Now, you need to return them each week because these are all that we got. We had another church just asking if they can have our hymn books. And I have to tell them, no, we're using them. So, sorry, Gordon. Tough luck. Um, but anyways, I wanted to let you know that. Um, also, I did want to let you know is that um, I do appreciate David and Ben with all the work that these men do. It's amazing. Week in and week out, they have to set up all these different things, make sure it's all working just right. They got to deal with me. It's amazing what they put up with. But anyways, is, um, 
and I know this happens from time to time. It's not just one of them. It's happened to both of them, unfortunately, that over the course of our time of recording these messages, that unfortunately, sometimes the messages get lost. And if you're watching us online, I want to apologize to you. We had a technical glitch that happened, and I know Pastor Phil put a lot of work and a lot of energy in getting that message out to us last week, but we've lost it, and uh, that that's it. And that's one of the great things about us having these recordings that we can be able to have them for posterity, and they're up there for all time. I know I've been very fortunate the last several years now, uh, last few years, I've been doing the Pastor Pano Preaches, and it's really touched me, not just because they're my family, but these were true men of God um, in my grandfather's messages and in my dad's cousin Tommy's that I've been putting up there recently because i got to get those back to his widow Sandra. Otherwise she'll hurt me. Uh, if I don't get them back, so I'm working on those. But it's really touched me to listen to these men's messages because that's it. They're not making any more of them. And once they're gone, they're gone. So I'm grateful that we're able to continue that onward and be praying that we don't have any more glitches like that in the future. And um, I know Dad is going to be continuing his study next Sunday. So bring your Bibles and notepads with you, and I know he's excited to share about that. Uh, also, Steve Weaver and Brenda Anderson. Can I see you at the close of the service? No? Okay, it was worth a shot. But anyways, um, I also want you to mark on your calendars. Is We are so grateful for Honey Tree as we shared and the blessing that she is through her ministry, music, and missions that she does for us. And she's also got us connected with a wonderful man of God. And I hope you'll mark on your calendar September the 3rd. He's been with us before, and he's coming back David Michael Carrillo is his name, and he's a missionary from Latvia, and uh, just a wonderful, sweet man of God, and uh, it's good to hear and exciting to hear what's going on there, and if you're not aware with your geography, um, Latvia, let's just say it's, it's here, and then just, there's one other country, I believe, and then right here is Ukraine, so as he put it last time, from where we're at, in relation, if we were Latvia and where Ukraine is, that's a drive to about, was it Pittsburgh or something? Of Pennsylvania. So pretty close that they're dealing with all these things in the world. And it's exciting to hear what he's doing for the kingdom. And I hope that you'll be there on September the 3rd. That'll be here before you know it. Then I also want to mark your calendar for September the 10th. On September the 10th, that's the second Sunday of the month, we're going to go back to what we've been doing throughout the year. I know I screwed us all up with our Back to School Sunday. How are you all liking your book bags, by the way? Good deal, okay. Uh, well, all right. Uh, but on September the 10th, we're wanting to encourage you because we're going to have our prayer shawls that Nancy Compton is putting together and the others that we have. And of course, if you've got somebody that needs a healing touch, emotional, spiritual, physical, grab a shawl for them on that Sunday. But I want to put a special emphasis that you will do your best to try to think of somebody that you can get a shawl for that's a child that's in grades first through eighth grade of thinking between now and then of getting a prayer shawl for some child that's grade one through eight. And then I want you to get that shawl and invite that child to come to be with us on October the 15th. That's the third Sunday of the month in October. And the reason for that is we're going to try to plan to do kind of a, a, a fall festival. with We're going to have chili, so there'll be some food for everybody. We'll have some fellowship, and we're going to try to have some fun. we got some games that we're going to put together in different stations that the kids can go to, and they can win some prizes and be involved and have a good time. How many think that sounds like a fun thing? Good. How many of you go, can I win a prize too? <laughs> and how many of you are going to say, you know what, between now and then, I'm going to be praying about those dates for David Michael Carrillo to get here safely and his ministry, and then be praying that the Lord will stir each one of us to find somebody within those grades that we can invite them to come for October the 15th, okay? So on September the 3rd, we're having who come to us? Good. Got about three of you listening. 
All right, September the 10th, we're trying to have prayer shawls for, for anybody who needs a healing, but also we're wanting to use them to invite people that are grades one through good. And October the 15th, which is the Sunday of the month, we're going to invite all those kids that are grades one through to be with us, and we're going to have chili and very good. We'll get better at this as it goes on. So we'll be sharing more about this, but I hope you'll mark those dates on your calendar. So again, we're going to have some activities there for the kiddos and kids at heart as well. And that's what we're going to plan to do. So, how many of you brought your Bibles to church today? If you did, let's see it. Lift it up if you can. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For your word. For your word. Help me to learn it. Help me to love it. And help me to live it. Amen. Good to see in the Bibles at church. We're going to get 100% before the year is done. All right. I, this morning, this is kind of somewhat part of my message. This morning was the Women's World Cup final. They had it on at like 5 a.m. this morning. Spain won. Spoiler alert there if you were really interested in it. Ole. And um, the English, the ladies there, they lost. But I watched a bit of it this morning, and it was really exciting because... They had, I thought it was a bogus penalty, but there was a penalty against the British and uh, they had, uh, they got to do a free kick that happened and they had just that goalie. Now that's one of the most incredible things to me in sport is when the goalie's actually able to block it. And they, she did. It was amazing to watch because you've only got a millisecond to think about which way is this, are they going to kick it to the left, to the right, up or down or in the middle? They're going to just kick it right in the middle you got to make a split-second decision, and that defender came through at the end. They were able to block that and save Spain from getting two goals. They lost because that defender messed up earlier in the game, but we won't dwell on that. Poor lionesses. But anyways, I wanted to talk to you today about that we all have a defender, a great defender that you have. And if you are doing in life, Something of worth, anything of worth at all in life. Just to let you know, as Pastor Phil's been sharing about persecution, there will be people that are going to come against you if you're doing anything of significance. If you're not doing a thing and you go, well, nobody's picking on me, it's because you're not doing anything. Um, but these people, they'll make negative comments about you. They'll try to discredit you. They'll belittle you. Human nature is to get in there and to try to straighten out those people. That's what we want to do. Our instinct, our impulse is go, I'm going to prove to them how wrong that person really is, how wrong they are. We think we have to defend ourselves. After all, that's our reputation that they're talking about. I need to stick up for myself. But the problem with this approach is as soon as you get one person straightened out, three more will pop up. I know this because my last name is carried with it sometimes where I've had to do a little bit of defense on there. So you learn with wisdom, hopefully these things come to you. But anyways, there's always going to be somebody that's going to be against you. Somebody that's trying to make you look bad. And if you're constantly trying to defend yourself, you'll get distracted fighting battles that you were never supposed to fight. You're wasting your energy if that's what you're going to do with your time. It's easy to get baited into conflict, thinking, did you see what they said about me on social media? Well, I'm going to show who, them who they're messing with. Do you know how much energy that it takes for you to try to pay somebody back, to try to prove something that wrong to them, that you can try to prove to them that you're really, at heart, just a nice person, and you'll spend so much time and emotional energy but that will take away from energy that could have been used for your dreams, to have a vision, to have goals that you could be doing instead. That instead is going to be consuming your mind and polluting it. So here's a key. You don't have to defend yourself, just to let you know. You don't have to always take up all these battles. God says that he will defend you. He'll protect your reputation. So quit worrying about the chatter, the negative comments, those, all those things that are distractions. 
That's the enemy trying to bait you to get off course, off the chart that God has for you, so you'll waste your time and energy involved in battles that really don't matter at the end of the day. Well, I'm upset because I'm a good person. What they're saying about me isn't true. doesn't matter how good you are, how loving, how kind, how upstanding. Somebody is out there is not going to like you. Somebody's going to try to discredit you whenever you're trying to do something. Don't think so. It happened with Jesus Christ, if you weren't aware of it. When he was on earth, here's what he went around doing. He went around healing the sick, lifting up the fallen, encouraging those that were down. He did nothing but good things while he was here. But yet, he was falsely accused. He was misunderstood. How did he choose to defend himself? How did he protect his reputation? It says in 1 Peter, <coughs> pardon me, chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. Even though he had never sinned or done any wrong, he did not retaliate when he was insulted. And when he suffered, he didn't threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of Almighty God. I wonder how much more peace we would have, how much more we would enjoy our lives if we would start leaving our cases into the hands of God. We spend too much time trying to defend ourselves, trying to prove to people who we are, worried about what they think. Why don't, don't you put your reputation in God's hands? I can assure you that God can vindicate you better than you can vindicate yourself. Even if you were Perry Mason, he could vindicate you better. See, you don't have to retaliate. You don't have to try to pay people back. Convince them to change their mind. The truth is that some people are never going to be for you. I feel bad about we live in such a hyper-partisan political system. I bet Joe Biden and Donald Trump can tell you there's going to be some people, no matter what, that are never going to be there for you. No matter what you do, they're not going to like you. They're intent on misunderstanding you. They don't want to see your point of view. They don't want to give you the benefit of the doubt. So don't go the next five years or ten years frustrated because they're negative towards you and engaged in battles that you're not supposed to be engaged in. It's time for us to leave these cases into the hands of God. Quit worrying about what others think. Quit reading what, about what they say on you on social media. Quit getting all riled about how you'll get retaliation and you'll pay them back one of these days. <laughs> well, as long as you're defending yourself, then the true defender, the Most High God, he'll step back. He'll let you do it your way. But when we make this decision of saying, God, I'm had enough. I'm turning this over to you. I'm not going to spend my life worried about what this person is saying anymore. And I'm tired of wasting my time and energy trying to change their mind, upset because they don't like me. God, I know you are my defender. I know you're fighting my battles. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 4 it says, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you victory. That's a very good defender to have. That's when the creator of the universe will go to work with you. When you reach that point of going, duh, I'm going to hand this over to the Lord. When people try to push you down, God will lift you up. When they try to make you look bad, he'll turn it around and cause you to look good. He'll cause you to shine where you didn't think you could. That's what happens in the scripture. It happened in the book of Esther to a man named Mordecai, if you're not familiar. He was a good man. He was doing the right thing. He was honoring God. But then there was this rascal of a guy named Haman who didn't like him. Mordecai was a Jew, and he wouldn't bow down to Haman and follow the traditions of his people. So Haman was constantly trying to discredit Mordecai. He was constantly trying to push Mordecai down. Make him look bad. And Mordecai didn't get upset. He didn't try to pay him back. 
he understood this principle that he had a great defender and he left his case into the hands of God. And in the natural, Haman had an advantage. See, he worked directly under the king. And in the palace, he had prestige, influential people, the position that was, he was put in. What could Mordecai ever do? But one night, the king could not sleep. And he asked his assistant to bring him one of the books that had the city's history recorded in it. This is why history is so important. It just so happened that the king read about a good deed that Mordecai had done. It's good to record good deeds. The king, he was so impressed that the next morning he called Haman in and said, Haman, what do you think we should do to honor a man that's done a good deed and serve the king with excellence? That's what he asked him. And, and Haman, probably like most people, was so self-centered, he thought, well, the king, he's talking about me because I'm this good guy and it's all about me. And so then he decided, I'm going to go big here because I want to get something good for me. He said, king, I think we should put a royal robe on this man. We should have a big parade, march him up and down the streets, shut down Calhoun Street so it causes all kinds of problems for people this morning. Announce what a great man this person is. And the king said, Haman, I love that idea. Now, go and find Mordecai and do just what you said with him. You march him up and down the streets and you get to announce how great he is. That's awesome. I love that. Isn't that a great story? I, I'm with Hydra. I love that. I'm just thinking... This guy just probably had just the biggest, what happened to him in history? And imagine doing that for your day of thinking, this guy that I've just been trying to destroy this whole time, I have to sing his praises up and down the streets in front of everybody else. Love it. God is the best God in the world. Anyways, so what am I saying with all that? God knows how to protect your reputation. So put your case in the hands of God. Quit spending unnecessary time trying to defend yourself. You have a defender, the great defender. God can do it better than you. He knows how to bring justice. He knows how to vindicate you. That's what Jesus said, did. He was disrespected. They called him a fraud, a cheat, an imposter. But the scripture said he made himself of no reputation. That means he didn't worry about his reputation. He knew he had a mission and a goal to accomplish. He didn't care. He didn't care if you misunderstood him. He knew that there would be people that would be negative, critical, finding fault. He didn't waste his time trying to prove to his critics that he was the son of God. He didn't go around upset because religious leaders didn't believe in him. Didn't go, oh, can you believe that? They, the Pharisees, they don't, they don't believe it's me. I'm just, I'm just calling it a day. He didn't do that. He just kept running his race, being the best, trusting his heavenly father to settle his cases. If, you've, if you're consumed with what other people think, why don't they respect me? I've got to try to convince them to believe in me. Then you'll get distracted and you'll miss your God-given destiny and the goals that God has for you. So let your defender go to work. God said he will fight your battles. He will take care of your critics. God will deal with those co-workers, those classmates that are spreading rumors about you, those other people around you. He'll take care of that friend, that family member that's trying to make you look bad. God knows how to settle the case. David put it this way in Psalm 69. Those who hate me without a cause are too many to count. It takes some good insight to recognize that about yourself. They attack me with lies. They make fun of me. I am the favorite town gospel. It gossip. It's the same way today. People can dislike you without even a cause. They just don't like you. Uh, people can dislike you for many, many reasons. They don't even know you. They just pass by you in the office. There's just something about you I just don't like. That's what people say to me all the time, and I don't know why that is. 
They've never been to lunch with you. They've never heard your side of the story. It'd be one thing if they knew you and didn't like you, but they judge you from a distance. That's not right to do at all. They don't like you because you're happy, you're successful, because you're talented, because you're a different na nationality. Honey Tree may not remember this, and it might be a little different version for her, but we went to the Hall's restaurant years ago. It was her, JR, and her father were all there. And we were talking about a missions. We were talking about a missions report because she'd been gone for a while. And I was, she shared her side, and then I was sharing all the fun things and good things that were happening at the church. Well, there was a grumpy old man that he showed up, and he was stuck at the table right next to us. And as I'm sharing all these things, you could hear him. He was trying to order some alcohol, and they wouldn't serve him the alcoholic beverage. And he was kind of upset about that, so he wasn't off to a good start. And then something happened to his newspaper. And you could hear all this while I'm sharing these things. And I'm excited, smiling, telling the story. And he just looks at me and he just goes, do you ever shut up? True story. True story. And thank God Honey Tree was there as the defender that day. Because I had grabbed my utensils going, if this is going down, I'm fighting dirty. And this will be the greatest headline in the city of Fort Wayne of a Hall's restaurant with Honey Tree and a Pano getting into a brawl, that would have been a great headline for somebody. But anyways, um, there's just some people that just aren't going to like you. And you got to learn to live with it. Like with David, they'll attack you behind your back and try to belittle you and discourage you. The, these are tests that we'll face in life. Are we going to pass the test and move on to the next level that God has for us? Or are we just going to keep on repeating that grade over and over again and go through the same thing because we've never shown the spiritual maturity to grow to the next level? Are you going to get offended and try to straighten them out? Are you going to take the bait involved in a battle that you're not supposed to fight? Or are you going to stay on the high road? They don't control your destiny unless you let them. They're a distraction trying to lure you off course to get you involved in something that's not that's between you and your destiny. One of the best things that we can learn to do in life is to ignore things. Don't pay it any attention. I'm grateful I don't have 24-hour news because those people that have it, doesn't matter which one they're watching, it just seems like they get consumed by it. It's a drug. They don't realize it. So anyways, I'm just stuck with the 30-minute the news. It's about 22 minutes, 8 minutes of pharmaceutical ads, and then the... <laughs> Then about two minutes of something uplifting at the end after they've scared you for the first 20 minutes. Tell if you come back. And we do. But anyways, that's how you need to leave things. You need to leave things in God's hands. And this is what David did. He went on to say, they hate me. They attack me. They make fun of me. But I keep right on praying to you. He was saying, I don't give it the time of day. I just keep on praising and thanking my good God for what he's doing for me and is about to do. Well, what they're, you might say, well, what they're saying, Andrew, is not true. What if they tarnish my reputation? I saw a quote, somebody said, you don't always have to defend yourself in words. Silence gives people the view that you have some better thoughts in mind. I like that. I'm, what I'm asking us to do is to protect your, put your reputation into God's hands. He'll do a much better job with it than you'll do. He said that he would protect it. The more successful that you are, the higher you go, more people are going to come against you. Nobody cares about somebody who's doing absolutely nothing, as I said. But if you're doing something of worth, then you're going to have some people attack you. That's what happens. They'll come against you. They did against King David. They'll talk about you without even a cause. Everybody loved you until you might have gotten that promotion, until you moved into that nice new home, until you married that beautiful woman. And now the critics will start coming out of the woodwork for you. You have to let your defender go to work. You have to be still and know that he is God. Let that really sink into you. He is God. It's easy for us to get all stirred up, thinking about how you can pay somebody back. What's the best strategy is to get even. I can tell you what it is. Be still. That's the best strategy. Be still. Leave that case in God's hands. God said in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 36. Jeremiah 51, 36. He says, I will defend you. 
I will be your lawyer. I will take on your case. Years ago, my father had a situation when someone accused him of something that he didn't do. And my dad thought it was a prank being played on him by Mike Berry. Because they used to do pranks on each other all the time. And anyways, this other person though, at that point in time, there was somebody, I got a good idea who, they were going around making a bunch of accusations about our family. Didn't care who you were. They were doing it and just saw, hey, if it sticks, it sticks. If it doesn't, doesn't. But I'm just going to cause problems for them. So they got the IRS involved. And these IRS agents showed up at his home at the time. And my dad just thought it was a prank at first. So he was not taking it as seriously as he should have until I think they showed him his bad, their badges and said, Mr. Pano, we really are with the Internal Revenue Service. Then the situation changed because then my dad had some great fear. He realized that, hey, this could be something trouble, even though he didn't do anything wrong. They were here at his door. This is pretty intense, pretty serious. And what he did, though, is thankfully he was part of the Cashman Foundation, and we met a great friend and an awesome attorney. He's a pit bull, and I love him, named Phil Terrell. And he didn't want my dad just some average, middle-of-the-pack attorney. He wanted to get somebody to represent him, defend him, that was going to be exceptional, that had a great track record, a lot of experience, very skilled. And he found that, was that man was just that. See, he went to court. And my dad, he didn't have to get up or argue his case and plead it before what's going on, trying to prove to the other side that he was right, convince all those that were there of his innocence. He just sat there and let the attorney do all the work, that defender do all the work. And he argued for him. He objected when he heard something he didn't like. He rebutted the other testimony. He was our defender. And he had done his part, given our deposition. And now it was in his hands. It was his case, this defender's. It was the attorney's battle. And he didn't have to, my dad didn't have to fight it. His job was just to be still and to trust that his advocate would work all things together for good. And after a while, it was all over. And the judge ruled in my father's favor. And it wound up that the IRS had to actually pay him some money that they owed him, but hadn't been doing such. And this would never have been found had that situation not been brought forth. So what I'm trying to say is, is that we have a defender that's greater than Phil Terrell. Not somebody that's average, not somebody that's mediocre. It's the most high God is representing you. And he said, I'll be your lawyer. I'll plead your case. I will take on those battles. And just like with my father, he'll work everything together for good and bless you on top of that in some situations. <coughs> now, Dad had a great attorney here in the city. But can you imagine... For just a moment, again, having the creator of this entire universe says, I'll defend you. I'll take up your case. You don't have to try to prove to people who you are, worry night and day about your reputation. You can stay in peace. You can relax, knowing that it's not your battle. It's your case, but the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to our defender. And I can tell you something. He has never lost a case that's been put into his hands. Instead of li living worried, stressed out, sit back. Let your defender do, your, do his job. In Numbers chapter 12, Moses' sister and brother, they started speaking ill against Moses. Miriam, Miriam and Aaron did this. And they didn't do this for a couple reasons. One is, you know, there was a little bit of jealousy that Moses was the man that God had put his favor and anointing upon as the leader. That didn't sit too well with Miriam, and she kind of bossed Aaron around as well, weak guy that he was. And, he, and the other thing was, is that they didn't like the wife that he had chosen. See, he had married somebody from a different nationality, a different race. And I can, you know, there's people like that, talking like that today. Well, why did they marry her? That wasn't right of him to do. He should have known better. Jerks. On and on, there's those people like that stirring up, and they were trying to make Moses look bad. For a lot of wrong reasons. And in verse 2, it says, The Lord heard what they were saying. The Lord heard what they were saying. When people are talking about you, don't worry. 
God hears it. You might not even know it's happening, but God knows it's happening, and he's our defender. It goes on to say that the anger of the Lord blazed against Miriam and Aaron. It's pretty powerful. Why was God so mad? Had they killed somebody? Had they lied? They cheated? Committed adultery? No. It's because they had spoken against the reputation of one of his children. Instantly, Miriam's skin was, I like this, this is great on God too. They're going, you want to be so proud of you being white? I'm going to make you white as snow with leprosy, is what he did to her. God takes it seriously when somebody tries to discredit you or belittle you. You don't have to get upset. God sees what happened. He doesn't sit idly by, oh, too bad. And he says, no, they're just ruining their reputation. That's not what God does. God goes to work when you put your faith and your trust in him. And he knows how to get people's attention, too, if he needs to. Sometimes he'll cause them to be quiet. He'll change their mind. Other times he'll let them keep on talking and just keep promoting you. The more they talk, the higher you go. They just think they're hurting you. The truth is they're actually helping you because they're bringing some attention to you. That's why marketing goes, you know, all news is good news if you know how to spin it. Um, they, but anyways, God is paying you back for what they're saying by taking you to other levels if you'll put your faith and trust in him. It's what the scripture says. God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. The very ones that tried to disrespect you, hold you down. They will see you in a position of honor, promoted, respected, with greater influence. That's what the def your defender does at work. My great-grandparents, I didn't know them, they pastored churches in their lives. And they had a couple, this is a story that I had been told by different members of the family, um, that they had a couple who attended that they thought that they were their friends. They really did. They thought this couple, they really care about us. However, they didn't realize this, but the wife in that couple is that she was going around gossiping and spreading all kinds of untruths about my great-grandparents and a bunch of falsehoods, trying to stir up division in the church, trying to get attention. There's unfortunately people like that. And you know what happened was one day with all this jibber-jabbering that she was doing, all this gossiping that she was doing, all of a sudden her mouth was closed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She couldn't open her mouth, is what I said. And her mouth was closed, and she couldn't say one word. Mm -hmm. That's how she was for days. They took her to the doctor to try to see what they could do. Nothing could be done for this lady of being able to speak. She just said, mm -hmm. Imagine that for a day, if any of us could. Husbands, be very still if you're imagining that for your spouse. Um, but anyways... Her mouth was closed, and one day, this woman finally got smart, and she quieted down her spirit, and they went over to my great-grandparents' house, and she wrote down that she was repenting of her sins, and at that moment, as I was told, is that she then was able to speak again, that the Lord restored her ability to speak. So, don't say you don't have a defender out there. Because when she finally got the boldness to admit I was wrong, the Lord did that. And that stinker was able to speak again. And it's amazing if we don't do anything what the Lord will do to work things out. And he'll do. God knows how to settle your case. He knows how to protect your reputation. It says in Psalms 105 verse 15, Psalm 105 verse 15, Touch not my anointed. We are his anointed. You may be in a situation where there's disrespect. People pushing you down, trying to hold you back. It's been that way for a long time. You don't think it's ever going to change. Well, get ready. Because I believe your time's coming if you've been faithful and true. God has heard every negative word spoken against you. He's seen every person that's tried to hold you back. Like with that, that man, vindication is in that woman. The vindication's on the way. Promotion for yourself is coming on the way. God wants to take you to another level of what he wants you to be. God's going to make those things happen that you could never make happen on your own. 
And he'll prepare that table right now in the presence of your enemies and settle that case for you if you put your faith and trust in him. So quit living frustrated trying to win somebody over that's never going to be for you. Your goal shouldn't be to change somebody's mind, convince them to like you. Take this in the right sense. Some people are sent to dislike you. That's why they're here. Don't believe so? Judas was sent to betray Jesus. If Saul had not disliked David, David would probably never have been on the throne. Everybody's been sent here for a purpose for you. And just like you've been sent for a purpose for them, too. David would have never... Anyways, you may be trying to win somebody over that's never going to be won over. Let God be your defender. He'll work it out. You don't have to try to pay them back, get even. Like with Moses, God will take care of your critics. You're not the judge. You don't have to straighten people out. Just run your race. Worry about, that's a great thing about track. You just have to stay in your lane is one of the rules of track. If you get out of your lane, you get disqualified. Just stay and run your race in your lane, and you'll get to that finish line you're supposed to. You run your race with integrity, with purpose. Run it with joy and thankfulness. And just let all that negativity bounce off you. Don't let it carry with you as you run your race. <coughs> Sometimes we think, oh, Andrew, if I can just get this person to stop talking about me, then I could be happy again. Then I could enjoy my life again. I don't mean to be negative, but somebody's always going to be talking about you, like I said. Somebody's always going to be jealous and trying to discredit you, whether you recognize them or not. The good news is, that's not your battle. You don't have to defend yourself. You have the great defender in Almighty God and Jesus Christ. How much freer you can live if you would start leaving those cases in the hands of our God. Not fighting battles that you're not supposed to fight. Not worried about your reputation all the time. Instead, trusting God to protect your reputation. I can tell you firsthand, if you're doing something that can make a difference in people's lives at all, and especially if you're doing something for the Lord and the cause of Christ and the kingdom and trying to make a difference eternally, you're going to have critics and a lot of critics in that. The more influence, the more exposure, the more of the negative that comes as well. But the truth is, I'm doing a lot better of not thinking about the critics. I'm happy. I enjoy my life. I'm grateful to be alive. I try to focus on the good things that God is doing and thankful for what he is about to do in my life. If you learn these principles and as you have this defender and as long as you're honoring God, being your best, that there's nobody who can stop you on this earth. No group, no organization. Promotion doesn't come from people. It comes from the Lord. It's interesting, when Jesus was here, the people who were most against him were the religious people. But Jesus didn't try to convince them. He didn't try to change their minds. He didn't spend hours arguing doctrine with them. Well, you see here, he didn't spend argue, uh, time doing that. He ignored his critics and just ran his race. One time, they criticized Jesus for healing a man on the Sabbath. He did the right thing, but they said he did it on the wrong day. You don't need to get in battles with people like that, because people, what do you think that guy that got healed says? You know, you're right. You make me paralyzed again, and I'll just wait till the next day and see if it will work out then. No. You'd be crazy if that's what he's thinking. He didn't care about that. And again, people like that, they'll work themselves out of going, can you believe they're criticizing this guy for what he did over there? Really? Some people, no matter what you do, are not going to be for you. We have to accept that fact, that not everyone is going to accept you. Not everyone is going to like you or understand you. I recognize that with our local newspaper. That's why I enjoy the reader's choice so much. But anyways, I've tried telling them different times over the years of here's things that we're doing. And you know what? They're not interested in that. And I've, I'm okay with that now because I used to have a hard time with that. I remember they wrote an article when we first began as a Mago Day. And they said, well, we'll see where they're at in a couple years. 
And I went two years to the day of that article and said, here's what we're doing. The journalist didn't even come downstairs. And I told him, you're going to listen on this phone in the lobby. I said, you're going to listen to this whether you do anything or not with it. That was my mentality then. Not a very nice thing to do. Probably why they don't want to do anything else with us <laughs> since then. That crazy painos down there telling us all these things they've been doing. But anyways, let the Lord work it out. Put those things into his hands. He'll work it all out for good. See, you're only going to go to a certain level if you handle those things on your own, like I just did there with the newspaper. That's as high as I'm going to go there with them. But you can reach a higher potential of touching more people's lives and be more comfortable being controversial. If you want everybody to like you, you'll get stuck. Jesus was the most controversial person that's ever walked this planet. He's a radical in the truest of sense when you think about things that he was saying back then and still today of what he was saying about loving your enemies. Good Lord, how are we doing with that as a people? Um, controversial stuff that he said. 2,000 years later, people are still arguing about him. He had more critics than anyone else, more critics than anybody here combined. Jesus Christ has them. But the scripture says he answered his critics not a word. He didn't waste his time trying to convince people who he was. We either find him or we don't. How much time are you going to spend worried about what, what the others are saying? Upset because of what maybe somebody put on social media. Trying to pay back that friend from way back when for making you look bad. You don't have time for all that pettiness. It's a distraction. It's between you and your destiny. Let it go in one year and out the other. And use then the energy to move forward to your God-given dreams and goals that he has for you. You don't have enough energy to answer your critics and fulfill your purpose at the same time. you got to choose one or the other. Whatever you're spending trying to pay people back, trying to prove to them that you're really this type of a person, that's emotional energy that you're not going to have to fulfill what God would rather you doing for his glory. Nehemiah understood this principle in the scripture. He was up on a hill rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And there were two people at the bottom of that mountain, Sambalat and Tobias. They didn't want the wall rebuilt. So they were there constantly yelling insults at Nehemiah. That's what these guys did with their day, Sambalat and Tobias, trying to bait him into a conflict, making fun of him, saying things like, Nehemiah, if a little fox walked on that wall, it would fall down. You don't know what you're doing. You're not a builder. Day and night, these two guys would keep on pestering him. I'm sure every now and again, Nehemiah was likely tested to either go down there and give them a piece of his mind or to say, I bet I could get one of them with this hammer if I... But see, he was smart enough to realize these two guys were just distractions. What they said didn't affect his destiny, his goal, the vision that God had given him. Their critical words didn't make the wall any weaker. See, they were trying to deceive him into losing focus so he would get involved into something that wasn't important. The truth is, every one of you at some point or another is going to have a Sanballat and Tobias in your life. Most of the people that come against us are simply distractions. The negative comments, the disrespect, the insult. Those are trying to bait and to lure us off the course that we're supposed to be on. The good fight of faith is not to try to straighten them out. The real fight is to keep your focus on the Lord and not get distracted and entangled in things that do not have any eternal value and do not matter in the grand scheme of things. If Nehemiah would have come down off that wall with all of his men spend a few days dealing with Sanballat and Tobias, all their people, he may have won that battle, but the wall wouldn't have been any further along and the war would have been lost. You have to ask yourself, if I engage in this conflict, if I prove my point, if I win them over, am I going to be any further toward my destiny or have I just fed my ego? Have I just made my flesh feel good? Stay on the high road. Your time is too valuable. We don't have enough of that. It's going short. 
Your destiny is too important. Your assignment to be a soul winner and a testimony for Christ is too great. It's too great to get involved in battles that don't matter. There will always be Sanballat's yelling insults. Always be a Tobias trying to get under your skin and agitate you. Don't worry. You have a defender. Be still and know that he is God. Let him fight those battles. God will take care of your critics. It's interesting, when Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall, he was up on the mountain. The critics were down at the bottom. The principle is, anytime you start answering your critics, you have to go down when you're doing that. When you start defending yourself, trying to prove yourself who you are, you're leaving the high place that God would rather you be at, and you're going down to their level. When you realize you have a defender, when you know God will fight your battles, then you'll do like Jesus and not answer your critics. You'll do like Nehemiah and stay on the mountain so you can focus on what's really important. Maybe today you need to go back up on that mountain. The critics will always be there. People that don't understand you. People that are never going to be there for you. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to let God be your defender. Put your reputation in his hands. God has already lined up the right people who will be there for you at the right time. The right people who will celebrate you and help you to push you into your purpose. And there's the whole key. Don't waste your time trying to convince the wrong people. Just run your race. Keep honoring God. Being your best. If you do this, I believe and I declare that God is about to settle your cases. Right now, he's preparing that table in the presence of your enemies. He's going to vindicate you. He's going to promote you. And he will take you to the fullness of the destiny he has for you in Jesus' name. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do ask that if those that have listened today if they don't have that great advocate, that awesome defender of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and if they want to receive him into their life today, I want to give an opportunity. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your advocate, your defender, and your Savior, would you lift a hand as an extension of your faith? Thank you, miss. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, let's all say this prayer together. Thank you, young lady. Heavenly Father, Thank you for loving me. And thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, raised from the dead, and to come into my heart as the forgiver of my sins, the healer of my body, and the defender of my faith. Lord, we do ask that you just accept me right now as I accept you as my Savior. And I'll live for you from this day forward. Heavenly Father, we do ask you to have your hand upon each one of us this week. Help us not to get distracted from the things that the enemy would need use to deter us from being the men and women of God you intend us to be. But help us to live on the path of righteousness, Lord, seeking to serve you and live for you as best we can. As we face the tests and trials that you have before us. Help us to pass them and move on to the next levels that you have for us as men and women of God. Help the example that we are living through our actions and if necessary, our words. Draw others unto Christ, Lord God. And for those that seek to criticize us, Lord, along the way, we turn them over to you, Lord, and have your Holy Spirit do a work within their life to hopefully get them upon the path of righteousness that they need to do that they can also know the fullness and the joy of living for you and serving you. It's in Christ's name that we have prayed. Amen. Now, Hi, this is Pastor Andrew with Calvary Christian Fellowship, and thank you so much for watching our service online. Just to let you know, Calvary Christian Fellowship meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Community Center, which is located at 233 West Main Street. We would love to see you there. In addition, if you'd like to support our ministry through a special love offering, feel free to use the contact information that is being shared on the screen right now. We do thank you for your faithfulness and your support. God bless you in this new week.
We're so pleased at Calvary Christian Fellowship that you've enjoyed our service today with us. We hope it was a blessing and an encouragement in your life. But I'd like to speak just for a moment to those of you that were watching, and perhaps you've never known what it is to ask Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior. And we'd like to give you that opportunity just before we say goodbye from this program this evening. So while we're in this beautiful environment that God created, He's not only God the Creator, but He sent Jesus to be our Savior. And all we need to do is to confess that we're a sinner and that Jesus came to die for our sin. And if we will believe that in our heart and confess it with our mouth and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior and Lord, at the moment you do that, you're born again, the Scripture says. You become a, a new creation. Old things, all the past is passed away, and all things become new from this moment on. And all you need to do is simply make that confession with this prayer. So I'm going to pray a prayer that hopefully wherever you are, you'll pray it with me right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for so loving me that you gave your son to die on a cross for my sin. I confess I need a Savior because I'm a sinner and I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to take over my life and to save me and fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask it, Father. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we want you to know on the authority of the Word of God. Welcome to the family of God. And if you live in this tri-state area around Fort Wayne and you don't have a local church to be able to go to, we'd love to have you come and join us. I believe my son, Pastor Andrew, gave all the information earlier. So come on a Sunday morning, downtown Fort Wayne. We'd love to see you in church. God bless you.